Today we actually have a um, very special guest here, uh, Justice Thomas Lee, his uh, associate um, uh, uh, chair, um, uh, deputy chair, or chief justice, sorry, chief justice of the Utah Supreme Court. Uh, he's actually the first uh, member of the judiciary to speak uh, as part of our um, speaker series, so I hope uh, this will be the beginning of many more uh, talks about legal technology uh, from uh, members of the judiciary. Uh, uh, Justice Lee was appointed to the uh, Utah Supreme Court uh, in 2010. Uh, he was a law prof, uh, the Rex Maureen Rawlinson uh, law prof uh, at B BYU uh, Law School uh, before he became uh, a justice. Uh, he's still uh, a distinguished lecturer at, at BYU. Uh, he, uh, before uh, 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 going into law, um, he was a law student uh, at uh, University of Chicago, uh, from which he graduated with high honors, uh, and after which he clerked uh, for, uh, for Judge Wilkinson on the Fourth Circuit, uh, and also for Justice uh, Thomas uh, on the Supreme Court. Uh, he, in, he was in private practice uh, for uh, several years before becoming a law prof. Uh, he was uh, with a firm that's now known as Parr uh, uh, Brown, G and Loveless, um, and uh, he was a shareholder of that firm uh, bec before he uh, he became uh, a law teacher. Uh, and you know he's also had a very uh, successful uh, uh, career in private practice as a, as a, as a litigator, IP litigator, and appellate litigator. He's uh, he's uh, tried uh, numerous cases uh, in federal courts and uh, and also in the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, also, he was worked for the government uh, for, for some time as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Division of the, of the DOJ. So in his talk today, uh, uh, Justice Lee will, uh, will address uh, the issue of statutory interpretation in the age of, of, of big data. And so, uh, so I'll, without further ado, I'll turn it over to, to Justice Lee. Thank you, Roland. It's a privilege to be here. Is the mic working? Um, what a beautiful campus you have and, and what, a, what a great law school. It's a, an honor for me to be able to be here and talk to you today. I, I want to um, present something to you um, that I started learning about a few years ago. I had a law clerk who um, had a graduate degree in linguistics and uh, we had a case that raised a problem of ambiguity and uh, he taught me something that I thought was fascinating and seemed to me to be something that may be uh, the, the wave of the future and uh, something that uh, I think ought to catch on to help us solve these kinds of problems of ambiguity. There was an article a few years ago in the Atlantic by a fellow named Ben Zimmer um, who observed um, at about the same time I started paying attention to this, ma made some similar observations. This was on the heels of a case called uh, FCC versus AT&T, the question that was argued in the, in the U.S. Supreme Court, the question presented in the FCC versus AT&T case had to do with the meaning of a personal privacy exemption in FOIA, uh, the Freedom of Information Act. So the, the uh, question um, presented in the FCC versus AT&T case had to do with whether a corporation can qualify for a personal privacy exemption. And the question came down to what, what do we mean by personal in the linguistic context of a personal privacy exemption. You can look up person and you can look up personal in the dictionary. You can find a range of definitions. Sometimes we think of persons as legal persons encompassing corporations. Sometimes we think of persons to make reference to, uh, to human beings. And, and that was essentially the question in the FCC versus AT&T case. The court um, received a, a, an important, I think, amicus brief from a linguist um, who presented some results of Corpus linguistics analysis and uh, Chief Justice Roberts' opinion for the court sort of elliptically made reference to that brief. And at the time, uh, Mr. Zimmer observed that um, he felt like this was a harbinger of things to come and perhaps a coming revolution for, uh, that the courts would eventually be facing um, in deciding problems of statutory interpretation. So that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about um, explain to you what corpus linguistics is about, uh, what kinds of problems it can help us tackle, and give you a, a sense of uh, the kinds of cases where it may come up, and, and um, uh, conclude with a discussion of an opinion that I wrote a few months ago 
a concurring opinion in, in the Utah Supreme Court um, in which I uh, proposed to use this um, model, this methodology, or this tool of, of linguistic analysis called corpus linguistics. So a, a lot of what judges do today um, is uh, we, we are mostly secondary lawmakers. We are agents of legislative bodies or agents of the people in interpreting constitutions. So much of what we do in making law is um, in, in the spirit of resolving ambiguities. If, if problems of statutory interpretation come up to us, it's typically because there is an ambiguity. Um, litigation is generated by uncertainty, and one of the kinds of uncertainty that uh, can generate litigation is uncertainty about the law. Another kind, of course, is uncertainty about the facts. But where there's uncertainty about the, about the law, the parties um, are likely to press their case through to trial and sometimes through to an appeal. And, and the problems that we face have to do with uh, resolving questions of, of ambiguity. This is a problem that comes up in, in a wide range of areas, both with respect to public law, the Constitution and statutes and regulations, also private law with respect to contracts or even a patent. Um, and other uh, sorts of provisions. I want to tell you, before I get into the detail here, I want to make a distinction between two different kinds of ambiguity. Linguists talk about syntactic ambiguity and structural ambiguity. And I've got a, I, I got a uh, Groucho Marx quote that actually illustrates both kinds of ambiguity. This is a, this is a syntactic uh, ambiguity, sometimes referred to as a structural ambiguity. Do, do you see the ambiguity here? Uh, it, it has to do with what, what is in my pajamas um, referring to. That, that's structural, that's syntactic. It has to do with the way the words in a sentence um, are, are put together. I don't know if this clicker's working real well. Okay, Here, here's a different kind of a problem. This is a problem of lexical ambiguity. Lexical ambiguity has to do with the lexicon, ambiguity with respect to the meaning of a particular term. Uh, what does outside mean in this context? Outside can mean two different things. It may have reference to sort of geographical relationships between two objects. That's the, the sort of pun that, um, that Groucho Marx is making here. Sometimes it means sort of besides or aside from. The problems of, of lexical ambiguity that we face uh, in the courts often have to do with the meaning of a word that may have a range of different meanings. You, you can find words in our lexicon that mean a, a wide range of different things. Port is a particularly ample word that can mean you know, anything from uh, wine to the bay that a ship um, goes into to the left side of a ship to the window on a ship um, to an adjective describing somebody's um, uh, weight. Um, this, is, this is what corpus linguistics can help us resolve. Maybe it can help us resolve a broader range of things. I'm not smart enough to know how it can help us resolve problems of, uh, of structural or syntactic ambiguity, but it's really pretty good at helping us resolve lexical ambiguity, a range of meanings with respect to a particular kind of a word. Let me, before I get into some detail and illustrate to you the kinds of cases that corpus linguistics can help us address, let, let me note that my thesis is, is not that corpus linguistics will resolve all problems of statutory interpretation. It's that there is a narrow band of cases that seem to come down to the ordinary meaning of a particular word in a particular linguistic context where we think that we can't resolve this problem by looking to the dictionary. Um, lots of, in, in many instances, um, in, instead of resolving a problem of statutory interpretation along those lines, we will decide that a statute is using a term not in its ordinary sense, but in a more specialized sense. It's using a legal term of art. It's using a technical scientific term. Um, or we think it's an ordinary term, but the alternative sense of a word just doesn't make sense in the linguistic or statutory context. Uh, of a particular term. But in a narrow band of cases, we're talking about something else. We are um, left to sort of decide uh, the problem of lexical ambiguity based on which sense of a particular term in a particular linguistic context seems more ordinary. So this is the uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes notion that um, modern textualists have sometimes pointed to that, that what we're 
asking in these kinds of problems of statutory interpretation has to do with the way that a normal speaker of English, using these words in the circumstances in which they were used, would understand a particular set of words to mean. There's a famous Justice Frankfurter quote along the same lines. Problems in statutory construction really bother us only when there are, is a contest between probabilities of meaning. And where the contest between probabilities of meaning is a contest that comes down to lexical ambiguity, which sense of port do we think that the legislature is using? Um, there's a really good tool that's available to us today to assess these kinds of problems. What I want to present to you for the next few minutes is um, three sort of examples of this kind of a problem. You've got a pretty well-known U.S. Supreme Court case, perhaps a somewhat lesser known uh, Federal Court of Appeals case, and then uh, I, I'm sure to most of you a, a completely unknown case from the Utah Supreme Court that I want to wind up with. The, the first one is a Stephen Breyer opinion for the court, uh, for the U.S. Supreme Court. The second is a uh, Richard Posner opinion for the Seventh Circuit. And, and lastly, I'll end with my opinion in the Rassabout case. My, my um, terribly immodest thesis for you today is, is that uh, the Breyer and Posner approaches are wrong and that the Lee approach is right. All right, so uh, many of you may be familiar with Muscarello. If you, if you took a legislation class, a statutory interpretation class, you probably came across this case. Frank Muscarello was arrested for distributing marijuana. Um, he uh, drove a pickup truck to the, uh, to the drug deal. He had a firearm locked in his glove compartment in the truck that he drove to the drug deal. There's this federal statute that provides a, a mandatory minimum sentence of five years if you carry a firearm in, uh, in relation to a drug uh, crime or, or a crime of violence. So the question presented in the Muscarello case is a question of lexical ambiguity. It's a question of what sense of carrying a firearm do we think Congress had in mind or do we think that the, the ordinary person would understand Congress to have had in mind in, in using that term in this uh, statute. You, you've got um, a, a, an argument, a debate between Justice Breyer for the majority and Justice Ginsburg for the dissent um, as to which sense of carry uh, the, the Congress has in mind. If you look up carry in the dictionary, you can find two different kinds of definitions. You can find one notion of carry, which is sort of uh, conveying or moving while transporting. Um, if, if that's the idea of carry that Congress had in mind, then Frank Muscarello carried a firearm of and in relation to a drug crime. On the other hand, if you look up the word carry in the dictionary, you'll find an alternative definition, uh, the second one that I've got listed here, which is the idea of holding or supporting in, in, in the context of a firearm, it's sort of packing. The, the second idea is, is packing a firearm. And the, well, the majority says, what, what I've got up here on this slide, that the re relevant linguistic facts are that the word carry in its ordinary sense includes carrying in a car. That's essentially, the, and it's a really significant, really important problem and important task. There is too much of a potential for us to do, uh, to, to engage in biased decision making here. And, and I think we should do whatever we can to minimize the risks. And that's what I'm proposing to do uh, with this method. So that's what I have to present to you. And I'm happy to take your questions. How soon do we need to end, Roland? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. I do, and it's an excellent question. Um, Judge Posner actually made reference to this very thing in, um, in the Costello case. He um, noted that, and I don't remember the exact dates, but he noted that the statute was something like 50 years old and alluded to the idea that maybe what we ought to be doing is some more historical linguistic analysis. He didn't call it corpus linguistics. Um, but, but uh, you know, maybe we ought to be tracing this back. The, he, he proposed to solve the problem, which I think is not the right answer, but proposed to solve the problem by saying the parties seem to concede that 
harboring means the same thing today that it did 50 years ago when the statute was passed. Um, I, I think there's a better answer to that, and, and corpus linguistics has it, and, and it is that there are uh, corpora that are, uh, in fact, time-based. In addition to the COCA, the corpus of contemporary American English, there's something called the COHA, the corpus of historical American English, and it will allow you to do a, a time-based search. It's not quite as big, especially if you're just looking at a particular decade, but if you had a statute passed in 1910 and you wanted to figure out what, what, does, what did harboring mean in 1910, you could go to the COHA or some other corpus that a linguist may have available um, and, and do some analysis like that. The Google News search engine allows you to do that as well, although it doesn't go back very far. Another aspect of what you're getting at, of course, has to do with constitutional interpretation. Um, the COHA itself, it turns out, goes back only to, I think it's 1810, which, which seems like a really bad, a, a lawyer sort of um, looking at the decisions that linguists made to go back to 1810 would sort of say that's malpractice. You know, couldn't you have gone back another couple of decades? It's exactly the wrong place to, to stop. Um, the linguists at Brigham Young that I've, I've been um, advising a bit and some of, the law, some of my former colleagues on the law faculty at Brigham Young are attempting to deal with that problem as well and they are engaged in, they have some fancy acronym for it, I think it's like COFIA or something, it's the Corpus of Founding Era American English and they are attempting to assemble a body of, of language along these same lines and using a very similar search engine that would allow us to um, figure out the ordinary meaning of the language of the Constitution in the, in the world of the, of the framers. And we've also been in contact with um, constitutional scholars. Uh, Randy Barnett at Georgetown has been somebody that we, we've been talking to um, about this application. And I, I think it's going to catch on in that area as well. But the, the timing question is a really important one. So thank you for that question. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, it's, it's possible to do better. I don't think it will ever be possible to do it perfectly well. Um, if, if we get there, I suppose I'll be out of a job and you know, I'll find something else to do with my time. Certainly, I, I mean, I had that slide up there where, where I said sometimes we don't worry about the ordinary meaning because we know from the statutory context what the term means. And certainly if the legislature defines its terms, that's what the court is supposed to go to. Only problem with that is sometimes the definition in turn has some inherent lexical ambiguity in it. It, it seems to me, so, so I would say, yes, we can do better, but no, I don't think we're ever gonna do it perfectly. It seems to me that there are two dimensions of the problem. One, one of them is that the human ad imagination is imperfect. We, we can't anticipate all the problems that are going to come along. I don't know how many members of Congress thought very hard about harboring an alien when they wrote that statute or when they voted on it or, or whatever. Even if they had, I don't know how many of them would have thought through this question of, well, do we mean conceal or do we mean simply providing shelter? So that's one dimension of the problem. The other dimension of the problem is that our language itself is imperfect. And the other thing we can't really anticipate is, is not just unanticipated legal problems or creative arguments that really smart lawyers from really good law schools throughout the country are gonna come up with in future cases, but also that our language evolves and that uh, we, we haven't really thought through all the dimensions of, uh, you know, when I found that sentence using the word port in about 17 different ways, I, I hadn't thought of all of those different senses of the term. I think that's another dimension of the problem as well. Other questions? Okay. Right.
Yeah, I, I actually hadn't thought about that, and I, I think that is a really good point. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, these are really good thoughts. I mean, I, I guess the way I think about it, and you, you can help me with what I'm missing, you know, in, in trying to respond to your, your comment, but the way I think about it is there is both a linguistic dimension and a more pragmatic dimension to, to the problem that, that you've identified. There was a U.S. Supreme Court case under the Fourth Amendment. I think I'm drawing a blank on the name of it, but somebody will maybe, Ky Kylo, I think. This is a infrared, um, technology case. I see a couple of heads shaking. I don't know if I'm even pronouncing the name of the case right, but uh, pr presented the question of whether it's a, an unreasonable search or seizure under the Fourth Amendment for the government to use infrared cameras that can essentially detect when somebody is growing marijuana inside of their home. Um, it, it seems to me that that's a pretty good example of what you're talking about. Um, if you're asking the question in terms of constitutional interpretation of what were the framers thinking about? What were they contemplating when they, when they said you've, you've got to have a warrant or you've got to be reasonable in engaging in searches that um, find evidence or seizures that um, come into somebody's home and take things out of them? It, 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 you're, you're never going to say, well, they were thinking about infrared cameras. So that's the sense in which there's a, a pragmatic dimension to this problem that isn't really a linguistic one. But it seems to me there's a linguistic dimension to it, too, and it's sort of a, a, a level of generality kind of a linguistic problem. You're going to have to ask yourself, uh, and, and you know, the, one of the court's prime originalists, Justice Scalia, concluded in the Kylo opinion, if I'm remembering it right, that that was, in fact, a search for the government to use that kind of infrared check technology. And, and it's basically based on the idea that at a high level of generality, we think that what the framers were concerned about and, and the linguistic notion of a search was employing something that would allow them to perceive something inside of someone's home that they wouldn't be able to perceive um, without um, a warrant or without breaking the door down. So I'm not sure if I'm really getting at all the dimensions of what you're talking about, but. Right. Yeah, and I guess what I, I'm, I'm just agree. Yeah, I'm trying to agree in part and, and say that maybe there is a linguistic dimension to it as well. I, I don't know that corpus linguistics can resolve the level of generality problem, but I, I guess what I'm trying to say is it seems to me that there may have been two different notions of search, two different senses of search. So, so probably the ordinary sense of search in one sense at the time of the framing, of course, would have been you break somebody's door down or you, you, you bust in unannounced and, and you find some evidence there. Um, if that's what we're saying, then yeah, that's exactly the problem. But, but I, I suppose if you looked back into a founding era dictionary, you might find search being defined also at a higher level of generality. And I, I think that's where the linguistic dimension comes in to the practical point that you're getting at.
Yeah. I think if, it, if it's an adjudicated fact, so linguists sometimes do forensic linguistics, if I'm remembering the term right, is something where you can try to find someone's signature on a document in the way that they tend to string words together. And it seems to me that if that's what we're talking about, if that's an example of adjudicative um, linguistic analysis, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing it because I, I think even though the search engine itself might be the, some, the, the sort of thing that, well, yeah, we can take judicial notice of the reliability of the search engine. I, don't, I think there is a lot of uh, subjectivity and, and coding and uh, things that, you know, there's going to be a lot left to the eye of the beholder in terms of how to interpret the results of corpus analysis if you're doing something like that. So at least for me, I, I think that's where you're going to need an expert witness and where I would feel like, I'm trying to resolve a disputed question of, of adjudicative fact, and it seems different to me. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just think it, it's totally different when we're talking about legislative facts rather than adjudicative facts. All five members of our court are engaged in linguistic analysis. And, 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 and in fact, all five members of our court are engaged in something going beyond what the parties are presenting to us. And I would think that we would not only tolerate that but expect it. It would seem awfully strange to me to say that in asking a judge to find the best sense of the words of a statute, we are limited to the dictionary definitions that the lawyers presented to us. We are limited to, if it's a question of statute uh, of constitutional interpretation, we are limited to the historical evidence that the parties presented to us. Nobody's ever thought that that's the way it should work until this tool came along. And, and, and my main reaction to it is, would we be better off with adversary briefing? Absolutely. But is it a bar to judges engaging their minds independently and trying to check their motivated reasoning and, and possibly you know, confirmation biased reasoning to, to use this sort of a tool? I don't see how it can be. Again, it seems to me that the question is, are we going to do the kind of linguistic analysis that linguists in the information age would say is the right way to resolve these problems? Or are we going to put blinders on and do it in an unreliable way that's sort of stuck in the 20th century? I, I, I think that's an easy question to answer. Go ahead and follow up. Tell me what you mean by that or what you think Justice Durant meant by that. Yeah. I mean, again, I, I just think the adjudicated facts realm is completely different. Even with respect to legislative facts, I mean, you're certainly right that uh, this is sort of building on the point I just made it a minute ago, that there, there is subject, subjectivity in coding the results of a corpus linguistic um, search, and there is a potential for 
error and bias in doing that. Uh, but if you compare it to the alternative, the alternative is the way we've been doing it forever is a judge says, this is the ordinary meaning of this term, take my word for it. My intuition tells me so and take my word for it. What I'm trying to say is it can't be worse than that to, to um, check our intuition against a publicly available um, search engine where we're looking at a big body of language. And the other thing I've tried to do to try to get at this concern, which is a, a legitimate one, is to put links in footnotes in my opinions so that if people, this is the other thing Coca can do for you. You, you, you can save your search and any reader or other member of the panel who should want to check your um, analysis and, and figure out whether you made some error that they might disagree with, they can go in and do their own analysis and figure out whether, whether you made a mistake. I think there have been hands up over here. Go ahead. Okay. Right. Yeah. So those are very interesting points. Let me see if I can address a couple of them and, and you can feel free to follow up if I've missed some of them. Um, the, the last point that you ended with, it's absolutely true that the, these are not um, sp these are not specialized corpora. So a, a specialized corpus would be um, a Lexis search of, of in the all feds database. Uh, uh, lo looking at the way words are used in judicial opinions or across the federal code or across the federal register lo looking at um, the way legal words are used in, in federal regulations. That's perfectly appropriate in a circumstance in which we think a word is being used as a legal term of art and I, I have advocated for that kind of corpus analysis. I've chosen these cases because Everybody seemed to agree in these cases that we weren't talking about legal terms of art, that we were talking about words that legislative bodies were using in their ordinary sense. And, and certainly that is a fairly common thing, at least in a subset of cases, we think that's what legislative bodies are doing. And if that's what they're doing, I don't know why you'd want to look for specialized legal terminology. You'd want to look for um, databases, bodies of language that were more general. Another point that you're suggesting, I, I think maybe you're misunderstanding what I'm proposing when you say we'd be better off with intuition than we would with um, using these search engines because I'm not proposing to abandon intuition. I am proposing to check intuition. And um, it, it seems to me that if, if you are concerned with um, the ability of legislatures and citizens to anticipate how a court is going to resolve a particular problem of lexical ambiguity. If you're concerned about um, 
judges making perhaps uh, motivated or, or, or biased decisions, you really ought to be more concerned about judges relying on dictionaries for things that they can't do and relying on their intuition for things that will almost automatically be beholden to problems of bias and, and subjectivity. So again, if, if all we're doing is adding a layer of, of a check, not, take, not substituting it for intuition, I, I guess I don't really see, I mean, you're raising a, a number of your other concerns, are, I think are very legitimate ones, but it, it, I guess my, my feeling on corpus linguistics is sort of to paraphrase Churchill on democracy, it's, it's the worst of all possible approaches except for all the others. I, I don't know how else to do this um, in a way that isn't much worse. That's my sense of it. Maybe take one last question. Yes, I am, and, and so I, I didn't maybe didn't explain it well enough. But in in the slide I had up early on, what what so here's the way I think about this. I think that at least for me, and I think for a lot of judges, resolving a stat, a problem of lexical ambiguity on the basis of what's the more ordinary sense of harboring or carrying or or, or discharging is sort of a last resort sort of thing. If we can find a better indication, it's a defined term in the statute or uh, it's, it's a legal term of art or a scientific term or the, the structure of the sentence just doesn't work. That's the sort of port sentence. We, we make sense of all those words port by where they appear in the sentence in relation to other words. But absolutely, I think there are cases where you can look to something in the legislative history and our sense of the purpose of the statute and it will say, look, this other sense of the word just doesn't make any sense as a matter of legal policy. And where we can do that, I mean, there may be some perils and problems associated with over-reliance on legislative history. That's a whole other subject and a whole different sort of a problem. But if we think we have a reliable sense of legislative purpose, and that legislative purpose dictates an answer to the question before us, I, I, that seems perfectly appropriate to me. Now, it won't always do that for us. I mean, if you read Justice Breyer's majority opinion in Muscarello and Justice Ginsburg's dissenting opinion, they both have plausible arguments about the purpose of Congress, right? Justice Breyer's point is any time a gun is present on a crime scene, there is a risk of additional violence. And, there, and he cites evidence in the legislative history that Congress was worried about that problem. Justice Ginsburg, I think, even more persuasively points to a whole lot of other things that says, you know, we're talking, we're thinking about, we're worried about people packing heat and pulling the trigger you know, not having it, you know, locked in their glove box. So it, it's possible, but I think, you know, perilous to, re sometimes perilous to resolve problems of lexical ambiguity in that way. You follow up? Yes. Yes. Well, I, I, I guess it, you've got stare decisis to take into account now. I mean, once Muscarello is decided, that's the meaning of federal law and lower courts have to follow it. Um, you know, if it's a state Supreme Court and a different state Supreme Court has interpreted a parallel statute in, in one way, that's certainly one data point that I would take into account. What I'm really looking for is what is my best sense of what I think the legislature of the state of Utah had in mind. Um, if something that the California Supreme Court says about a similar statute seems persuasive to me, then I would follow it. If I'm not persuaded by it, I wouldn't follow it just to, to be going along, but probably other dimensions as well, but that's, that's one dimension of an answer to your question. So thank you very much.